Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part two of the body of Moses. Turn your Bible to Jude chapter one. In part one, we did I did a commentary on Jude chapter one. I'm just going to read verse nine. Jude 1, verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So, two things you get from this. One, Michael the archangel was arguing with Satan, the devil, and he wouldn't openly condemn him. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. But why in the world is the devil disputing about the body of Moses? Why? Well, it's really quite simple when you think about it. All right, everybody, turn to the book of Deuteronomy the fifth book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, at least in the King James. I guess we'll start reading from verse 1. Now, remember, Moses had been raised up in the house of Pharaoh. Moses fled after he killed the Egyptian. Moses was called of God to go into Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And um, guess what? Um, you had the Passover, the plagues and the Passover, and then the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, this is the end of the ministry of Moses. Moses is getting ready to die. All right, so let's read, with that background, let's read Deuteronomy 34 and verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah unto the uttermost, I'm sorry, and unto the utmost sea. And the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, You got the Lord speaking directly to Moses. Think about that. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. Now, you got to realize something. The church world will make try to make you think that uh, the Lord made a covenant with the whole world, but he didn't. He did not make a covenant with the whole world. I mean, Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael and he had Isaac. He blessed Ish, uh, the Lord blessed Ishmael for Abraham's sake. But he said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, not Ishmael. And then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Esau was rejected. And in Jacob, who God changed the name to Israel, that was to be the promised seed. And they'll try to convince you that, uh, well, basically in a nutshell, they'll tell you, well, you know, God made a covenant with the Jews and the Jews rejected him. So God's up in the, the heavens biting his fingernails going, oh, I've got to have some people that love me. So he went to the, the Gentiles, which they'll tell you those are the non-Jews. That's the nonsense that uh, the modern church world will try to con Vince you is the truth. But 
you know, if you look into Jeremiah 3, 8, you can see that God divorced Israel, but not Judah. Israel and Judah had different kings, different land areas, different capitals. They even fought wars against each other. They're not the same people. And then God divorced Israel, but not Judah, because of the promise he made with David. So, God promised in Jeremiah 3.8, he divorced Israel. And then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, he said he would make a new covenant with who? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. The same people he divorced, he's going to remarry and make a new covenant with. Not the whole world. No. So, so the Lord showed Moses the land, okay? Verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Why? Because Moses struck the rock twice. Um, he disobeyed the Lord. So, Moses, you get to see the promised land, but you don't get to go in. So, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, who buried him? The Lord. Can you imagine having your funeral presided over by the Lord himself? Wow. Think about that. Now, there's no record of anybody else being there with Moses. No record. It's just Moses and the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. No man knows where his grave is unto this day. Ah, the Lord himself buried Moses in a secret place that no man, well, secret to mankind, and, you know, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher or grave unto this day. Why did the Lord do that? You know, it's not too hard. I could give you the short version or I can give you the long version, but I, I think I'm going to try to go the medium version. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His, his eye were not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and he did as the Lord commanded Moses. You want to hear a testimony? Verse 10. And there rose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and the wonders which the Lord uh, sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand, and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Now, remember, uh, Moses, with God's spirit and power, parted the Red Sea. Uh, all the plagues of Egypt, which uh, are foreshadows of what's going to happen in the plagues of Revelation. Uh, Moses tapped the rock twice when he shouldn't have, just once. Uh, water came from the rock. 
you know. So Moses was filled with God's Spirit and performed a lot of miracles. So what's the, you know, and the Lord buried Moses and nobody, no man knows where it is. So why was the devil contending, disputing, arguing with Michael about, Michael the archangel, about the, um, the body of Moses? Well, there's a reason for that. Sure. All right, this, uh, we're going to go to the book of uh, 1 Kings and go to chapter 17. I'm going to skip around a bit because I don't want to make this a super long Bible study. And if you want to learn about the life of Elijah, probably my favorite Old Testament prophet, um, I've got an hour and 40 minute study on Elijah. He led a very interesting life and he's going to come back. He's one of only two people in the Bible that never died. And he's going to be one of the two witnesses that confronts the false prophet and the beast. The other one is Enoch. They're the only two people that have never died in the Old Testament. So let's skip around just a little bit and we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 17. So get your King James and open it and let's read. All right, uh, let's see, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, don't ask me what a Tishbite is, because I, I don't know. Uh, I've read different opinions, but I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me. I don't believe. Anybody knows, let me know. I'd be interested. Um, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, now we're talking about King Ahab to the northern kingdom of Israel, not Judah. And Ahab was a very evil king. He was married to uh, his lovely wife, Jezebel. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. Um, she was probably only lovely in physical beauty, I guess. Um, and... Uh, Perhaps you've heard of, well, you've heard of the Jezebel spirit. Well, that term is well-earned. Jezebel was bad news. She worshipped, uh, helped, the, helped promote Satanism, and she killed Ahab's neighbor to steal his vineyard. So uh, even Ahab wouldn't do that. I mean, she was... She was wicked to the core. And that's the problem. That's why we have to marry, and I'm a hypocrite, we got to marry people that, mm, well, you shouldn't marry people that are going to drag you down. Marry believers. There's a reason for that. Ahab was bad, but compared to Jezebel, he was at least somewhat godly. Somewhat. So he said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So Elijah, by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed there'd be drought for three years. And guess what? He's going to have the same powers to do the same things during the period of the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. So, he comes to a widow. He comes to a widow's house, verse 13. And she's got just a little bit of flour left and a little bit of oil and a little bit of water. And she's getting ready to make her last meal and die of starvation. So, what does Elijah say? And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it to me, and after make for thee and for thy son. So, 
she recognizes that, okay, this guy's a prophet. So, uh, verse 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her uh, house did eat many days. Verse 16, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So, here it is, her, uh, her flour and her oil, and I guess the water, never ran out. And Elijah stayed with her. Well, in verse um, 18, um, her son dies. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? See, her son died, right? But what about in verse 22 and verse 23? Well, Elijah prayed to the Lord. And then it says in verse 22, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said unto Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. So, in ver, uh, chapter 18, verse 1, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. So he's been with this woman probably around three years, right? Saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So, and Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Well, yeah, if there's no rain for three years, what kind of crops are you going to have? Virtually nothing, right? Now, you can read in Isaiah, uh, 1 Kings 18, how Elijah challenged Ahab's satanic prophets, the prophets of Baal, or Baal, B-A-A-L, to a challenge. And there was 450 of them and one of Elijah. And um, he challenged them to a thing where they were to do sacrifice. And they said, if fire comes and takes the sacrifice, well, you'll know whose God is ruling in heaven and earth. So the prophets of Baal were all chanting and cutting themselves and, you know, waiting for their sacrifice. 450 of them. And Elijah said, uh, okay, take some water and pour it on my sacrifice. And they did that three times. And then the Lord, um, at the word of Elijah, the Lord brought down fire from the sky and devoured the sacrifice and then um, Elijah had everybody kill the prophets of Baal boy you don't hear that stuff preached in churches today do you oh no yep so um, Jezebel got all upset because hey Elijah killed off her prophets or well, had the people do it or whoever the prophets were dead. The false prophets were dead. So, Elijah the, raised somebody from the dead. The flower never ran out. Fire came down from the sky to take the, um, the sacrifice. And then there was a um, time when, I think it was twice the soldiers of Ahab and Jezebel, 50 soldiers, went to go capture Elijah. And he called, he says, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from the sky and devour 
the captain and his 50 men. And it did. Not just once, but twice. I mean, you know, Kenneth Copeland and all those uh, uh, so-called charismatics, they brag about having all this uh, Holy Ghost power, but I'm telling you what, Elijah was the real deal. He didn't have to fake nothing. This guy was full of the Spirit of the Lord. You can read about the uh, fire coming down from the sky here. 2 Kings 1 and 10, verse 1 and 10, and then 2 Kings cha uh, ver uh, chapter 1 and verse 12. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now remember, these soldiers were going to capture Elijah and take him to the king and queen and have him killed. Verse 12, And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So, that's real Holy Ghost power there. All right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. I'm going to skip around a little bit because, like I say, you really want to study uh, Elijah the prophet's life. I've got an hour and 40 minutes study for you. Yeah. Do you know how long that thing took to process on my computer? Uh, it took over two hours for that thing to process on my computer. And then I had to load it onto YouTube. Oh, boy. But uh, he's going to come back one day. And like I tell everybody... The New Testament is a shadow, was a, well, the, the Old Testament was a shadow of what was going to happen in the New Testament. And Elijah is going to come back to confront the false prophet, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist. And uh, he's going to have these same powers. Matter of fact, my opinion is the... Um, the false prophet, I bet you he's going to claim that he's Elijah also. That's what. That's my opinion. I think so. Because he's going to have the power to bring fire down from the sky to devour and destroy those that oppose the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So he's going to, just like the, um, in... Pharaoh's court when Moses confronted him and Moses or or was it Aaron no it was Aaron Aaron threw down his rod and the rod became a snake and then the magicians of Pharaoh did the same thing and they threw their rods down and they became snakes and then Aaron's rod swallowed up uh, Pharaoh's um, magicians snakes you know so sometimes Satan's prophets can mimic the things that God's prophets can. God allows that because he wants to test the people. Do you want to do it God's way or do you want to do it God's enemy's way? Your choice. But I think the false prophet is going to call himself Elijah and have mimic the powers. And those so-called church people that claim to be Christians that don't bother to read the Bible, well, when those claiming to be Jews proclaim that even the Messiah has come, personally, I think, especially the Messianic so-called Jews, I think the great majority of the church people are going to follow the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, especially when you got this uh, false prophet that can bring fire down from the sky and, you know, maybe there'll, there'll be an army of, I don't know, maybe Arabs confronting him and then fire comes down from the sky and devours him. I mean, they're going to say, oh, even Christ has come. And besides, you know, they're all looking to fly out of here when the pre-trib rapture. So, you know, they're going to 
they're going to be fooled. I think the great majority of them are going to be fooled. So read read the book, people. I'm not making this stuff up. You know, I don't make this stuff up for my health. I don't have a book to sell you, and it's only nineteen ninety five. And and if you order now, I'll send you a prayer cloth uh, from Israel, the Israeli land that's been blessed by the rabbi. That was dipped in the Jordan River. You know, come on now. You know, do I beg you for donations? No. No, I don't. I don't have any books to sell. You know, I mean, come on. So, all right. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Now, I don't think uh, Elisha was disobeying Elijah. I think Elijah was merely testing his faith to see if he would be faithful and stick with him by the, his side. But that's my opinion. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha uh, uh, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Shut up. Be quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the Bob translation. And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. In other words, Yeah, yeah, I know. Be quiet. Verse 4. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he, and he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Seems like we've heard this story before, huh? And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So Elijah did basically the same thing that Moses did in the parting of the Red Sea. But he did it um, by the River Jordan. So, you know, this is some Holy Ghost power there, right? And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Listen carefully. Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Oh, yeah? You know that Holy Ghost power you got? I want double. I want twice. <laughs> you know, the Bible says to come boldly before the throne of grace. That's what Elisha, Elisha did, boy. He was, he was going boldly before the, the throne of grace here, you know? It's like, oh, yeah? I want double. Lord gave you a cup. I want twice. I want a cup twice that size. And he, Elijah, said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold 
of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Wow. So Elisha, Elisha got twice the power of Elijah here. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted, parted, parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Wow. So he did the same thing that Elijah and Moses had done, right? Okay. All right, let's skip to 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. So what did Elijah's, Elisha say? And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. So he healed the waters. Cross the uh, River Jordan. All right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine hadn't made hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. And he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. In other words, borrow as many empty pots and pans and bottles as you can. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Now you can read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, in uh, verses 32, verses 33, 34, 35, that um, Elisha raised a child from the dead. So, uh, in verse 38, there was, um, they were gathering food and they put something poisonous in the pot. And um, Elijah made it so that uh, it was clean and that they, they could eat it. You could read that in verse 40. So, you know, Elijah, Elisha had, you know, power of the Holy Spirit. You can read in chapter 5, that uh, 2 Kings 5, chapter 5, how uh, he told a leper to dip himself in Jordan seven times, and he was healed of leprosy. Now, one of the enemies of Israel in chapter 6 wanted to capture Elisha because he was giving tactical advice, I guess you could say, to the king of Judah. And uh, they were going to try to capture him. So let's go to uh, 2 Kings six fourteen. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. So they surrounded the city where Elisha was. 
And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an angel uh, and host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And then if you want to read the rest of it, he uh, took all the blind soldiers and led them into the capital city of Samaria. So, you know, uh, Elisha had chariots of fire protecting him, and he blinded the soldiers with blindness. I mean... It's kind of hard to fight when you're blind, you know? Now, if you don't know it, uh, Malachi 4, 5, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, that great and dreadful day of the Lord is for unbelievers. For believers, it'll be the day of your resurrection and uh, new body. All right, let's get done here. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20. Here is why. Well, here's the end. And Elisha died, and they buried him. Okay, so Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, behold, they spied a band of men. So here it is, they're, they're burying somebody. And they see a group of probably soldiers. And then and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones, he and, and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. You see, when, when uh, they threw the, the dead man on top of the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. He was revived. I mean, he was raised from the dead. Ah, can you imagine that? The mere bones of Elisha was probably so full of Holy Ghost power that uh, a dead man touched the bones of Elisha and he came back to life. So, why did the Lord bury Moses and hide his body? Maybe the same reason. Why was Satan contending with Michael the archangel about the bones, uh, about the body of Moses? This seems to be as plausible uh, an explanation as any, you know. Because trust me, uh, people, they would have loved to dig up the bones and who knows what they would have done with the bones. Turned them into a, a talisman or a talisman or something like that. I don't know. I have no idea. No idea at all what they would do. But uh, the Lord saw to it that Moses, that no man knew where Bo, uh, Moses was buried, possibly for the same reason. Because who knows, maybe they would have dug up his bones and tried to raise up people from the dead. I don't know. All right, so now you know why, possibly, why God himself buried Moses and hid the body from mankind. At least that's my educated so-called guess. All right. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain, 
from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.